Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Jared Williams, and today we're doing our accountability call. As you know, every other Sunday we get on a call and we discuss topics that are going to benefit. We're going to discuss topics that are going to benefit you as a future dental student and or a future dentist going into the career of dentistry so that you can perform at the highest level. And so today we have Dr. Butch Diggs that's coming on the call so that he could share some insight with you so that you can do great in dentistry. So here we have it. I'm Dr. Jared Williams. This is Dr. Butch Diggs, and we're going to do some uh, have some amazing conversation. I'm going to um, get it unearth as many things as I possibly can so I can get better. But at the same time, you'll be getting better at the same time. So once again, get some notes, grab a friend, share, like, and subscribe this page in this video so that the world can see that if we did it, you can too. All right. So welcome, Dr. Diggs. How you doing, boss? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a Appreciate pleasure. It. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So what I like to do first is I like to just do start off with, you know, how did you get into dentistry? And, and let's take it from the high school level because individuals are coming in. They're probably going to be watching this from either just getting into college and wanting to figure this thing out. And so we want to know exactly how you did it. Okay. Um, let's see. Started off in high school, actually, um, as a uh, I told a few other people, uh, we basically had a, uh, there's a division of the Boy Scouts of America that had, uh, once you reached your junior, senior year of high school, they had interest groups called the Explorers, and they had what were called nursing explorers, uh, medical explorers, and whatnot. One group was called the Dental Explorers, and uh, some, um, I guess what you would call representatives came to our school, asked us, um, you know, if anybody here is interested in dentistry, we have this uh, group called the Dental Explorers. We meet as such patients, and they basically uh, put us in, um, it was about probably six or seven different high schools from that region, uh, where they grabbed about maybe two to three, depending on how many were interested in dentistry, and put us, um, had us meet about once a month during the school year. Uh, each meeting had a dental, uh, you know, either a, um, a teacher from a dental school or a actual practicing dentist who would come in and talk about the different aspects of his career, uh, what he liked, what he didn't like, what it entailed trying to get into dental school, his experiences in dental school, um, and what uh, one could expect once they get out of dental school. Uh, you know, and reach the, you know, the professional community. And our last, um, I believe our last meeting of the year, they actually took us to uh, University of Southern California uh, to one of their, uh, to the dental school. We actually got to meet the faculty, students, uh, tour some of the labs and whatnot, had lunch with some of the faculty. So that was the beginning for me. <laughs> All right. And, uh, did you want to go on? Yeah, please, <laughs> please. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, share. Sure. Okay, so then um, once I got into uh, college, I went to University of Redlands, and I was a biology major. And somewhere around my sophomore year, they uh, some of the medical uh, schools in California and some of the dental schools in California were uh, sending representatives on campus to look for qualified applicants. Remember back then, see, I'm dating myself now. Sorry. We didn't have the internet, computers, or anything like that, so they just couldn't access everything they wanted to. You usually had to obtain it in person. And so we, um, there were some representatives from UCSF, USC, UCLA, uh, and particularly they were looking for uh, minority students that they felt would be qualified to apply. And uh, so when I talked to two from UCSF and uh, USC, um, they said, well, you know, um, now, now that we know your qualifications, we think that, you know, you should apply starting next year. So... Uh, at the end of my senior year in college, um, I took a, what was called, I guess, a gap year uh, and worked. And during that time, I also applied uh, to, um, you know, three or four different dental schools. Wanted to stay on the West Coast, so it was uh, USC, UCLA, UCSF. And um, got accepted to a USC and a UCSF. And <clears throat> basically, I thought, well, I had to make the decision, do I want to leave the city in Los Angeles where I lived, or do I want to, uh, you know, get out and, you know, experience something new? And I thought, well, there's too many distractions where I lived in Southern California, so I decided to go up to Northern California, which turned out to be a pretty good decision. 
And uh, that was when dental school started. And that was the shock therapy mm. at that point because um, when you do get into dental school, people are there for a reason. Mm. And so if you think college is, I guess what you will call, uh, you know, oh, everyone here is smart. Well, that's you know, pretty much exponential once you get to dental school. Mm. And the first thing that we learned uh, was that they graded, I don't know if they still do this because this is some time ago, our, at our dental school, they graded on a B modal system, meaning the average grade in the class was somewhere between a B and a B plus. <laughs> That's, <laughs> uh, yeah. That was the average oh, wow. grade. Oh, and wow. so uh, you were considered kind of, you know, lagging behind if you were doing a C or something wow. like that. And, and they told us that at the beginning. And they also said that uh, one of the uh, deans of the school said, you know, our primary purpose of these first two years is to weed you out and find out if you really belong here. And so you really had to be aware of what was going on um, at the, uh, you know, during the school for the test, the assignments, um, first two years with mainly everyone trying to get into the dental clinic uh, so they could start working on patients. So the first two years were like pretty, you know, intense. Um, you didn't really have time for anything else. Once you got into the clinics, you kind of like, kind of could, you know, manage your schedule so that you had time for a few other things. So it okay. wasn't so bad. So um, let me ask you this um, okay. before we ju go, because we're moving a little quick, but I wanted to take a step back. You were a biology mm -hmm. major. I want to I ask you a couple questions. Why biology? And then you had the option of leaving. You said there were some distractions. I want to unpack that a little bit for some of those individuals that, oh. that kind of skip. <laughs> Then get that piece of information. So why biology, and then why the whole thought process of the distraction? Um, uh, back then, I was doing a lot of things musically, also, okay. and I had to make a choice. Uh, did I want to like stay with this band that I was playing with, or you know? And I said, but I can't do that and do dental school at the same time. So uh, it, it was that decision I had to make to you know get out of Los Angeles, you know, and just kind of make a break completely and then get back to it hopefully you know once i was done with dental school um biology because i hate math so <laughs> and i'm just gonna leave it at yeah. that i i was more interested in the life sciences uh, more than anything else um back then engineering wasn't really the hot field okay. uh, it was like a very small field and people looked at them like what <laughs> You know, they. I think the smallest amount of graduates we had at our graduate was the engineering department. Um, and I think about probably four years after I graduated, they pretty much did away with the engineering department. So, you know, that's still, a, yeah. I mean, I heard it's back now, but back then, you know, the big ones were like education, uh, business, um, and people want to do either pre-medical, pre-dent, pre-nursing, things like that. Now I have a question, would you recommend doing a biology major for students that are like have biology or considering biology or something? Yes, um, any type of life science I think would be really helpful, but particularly core sciences, you know, if you, um, biology is a good one. And they have other majors now. When I talk to some of my students that are at uh, the University of Arizona, I hear majors that didn't exist when I was in school. It's either biology, chemistry, you know, physics, math, uh, you know things like that now they have things like quantitative biological analysis my is uh you know building a building i don't know <laughs> and so I'm, I'm trying to go well where does this fall what categories is this is this a life science thing is this a dentistry thing uh, is it a pre-dent pre-dent pre-med things like that um but they um anything has to do like you know a heavy science major is a real big advantage oh, wow. a real big advantage um a lot of it's on the dat um, for us, they told us, um, I was going to say physics, chemistry, um, of course, some, you know, math calculus, at least up to the calculus level. Right. Um, but if you did your, uh, for biology majors, they had us, uh, doing chemistry, you know, you take bio a lot of biology classes. Um, but there also was an emphasis on taking, um, you know, chemistry up to, uh, P chem, if you wished uh you know depending on what where you wanted to go or and then you also had you know the math that you had to do and you also had the, the physics um that you had to do and then in between that was a whole lot of other biological classes uh that you had to take uh you know genetics and things like that so okay 
right, all right. Thank you for answering those questions. Now, my question is this: is that um, you get into co- you get into dental school? You're coming from um, college, University of Redlands, right? Right. Right. You get into um, dental school. What is that like? Now, once again, this is diversity in dentistry. <laughs> we speak about being a um, black person or a Hispanic person going or native um, Pacific Islander going into an uh, institution that necessarily wasn't thought of for them. Um, what was your experience going in? And um, like I said, as transparent as you could be because there's individuals on here that are probably going to have the same experience. Um, or walk into that same experience because not much has changed. You know, I was there was a stat that that I was that it was dropped upon me, and at the University of Texas School of Dentistry, since the inception, there has been two hundred and I want to say forty three or sixty three. Let's take the up. Let's take the high. Two hundred and seventy students of color that graduated from black students that have graduated from their school. Yes. That does not include. That does not include. That includes hygiene and dentistry. Just want to throw that right. out there. And this is like this, I would say this predates nineteen. Um, this predates you know two thousands, nineteen eighties, sixties, fifties, forties, so on and so forth. So that's a lot. That's that's a very small number. So I wanted to just drop that out there. Not to poke holes at people, but just to bring some awareness because that's what we're all about. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, just from personal experience, uh, when I got into dental school, there were five in my class. That was out of a class of 118. Hmm. We had five. So um, how, how did that, I want to stop you right there before we go any further? Because I want to stop you. 110, you're five. Give me that experience. You're walking into this. <laughs> you're walking into this school. <laughs> I want to. I want to unpack this. So I want to take this slow. So go ahead. Give me that mindset that you're walking into. Um, it was eye opening, hmm. to say the least. Because um, you know, when I applied and when they said I was accepted, they, you know, of course, they don't give you the statistics as to who's who and who's coming in and you know what the ethnic background is. You find that out on like the first day. Hmm. Um, I went to an orientation that was um, uh, some of the actually it was interesting. Some of the uh, minority dental students from classes ahead of us decided to have like a summer orientation about two or three weeks before classes started. Mm -hmm. So that way you got to see all the minority students who were in your class. And if I had to estimate, we were probably about maybe 20% total, all of us. And that's, you know, black, Hispanic, uh, Asian or Pacific Islander, uh, Native American, Mm -hmm. Uh, that was it. (laughs) And, um, uh, it, it, it was kind of interesting. Um, uh, the class before us only had two African American students and I believe five Hispanics out of a class of 105, I think, or something like that. Mm. Uh, and uh, just two black females. And, and that was it. And they pretty much tried to help us as much as they could. Mm. Class ahead of them had, I think, four. And the senior class had three okay so so it, it, go ahead no 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 go ahead go ahead finish it so basically it, it seemed like we were averaging somewhere between two and five mm. per year now this is california did you feel like how how were you how did you feel like you're walking i know it's not texas i'm in texas <laughs> so maybe a little different just a little bit just a little bit but what was your what was your experience in california and, and just from that from, from um well, yeah, because I grew up in pretty much a probably eighty percent black community, and okay. um, going to University of Redlands, uh, it, there weren't a lot of us there, uh, so it kind of in a sh- small way prepared me. But once you get mm-hmm. to like uh, a campus like say UCSF, which is like in a completely professional campus, mm-hmm. pre-professional, um, there is no undergrad. There's medical, dental, pharmaceutical nursing, dental hygiene, uh, PhD programs, you know, for biomedical engineering, things like that. So everyone there, you know, is really, really there for a purpose. And we were a very small minority. I mean, we, we found each other um, and, uh, you know, basically had to kind of like coalesce. That's what got us through school. Um, the diversity of where they came from was pretty interesting because we had uh, one student from uh, one of the black students from UC Davis. The other one came from Howard. 
Um, I spoke from uh, UCS, uh, from uh, University of Redlands. Uh, the other one was from Cal State Hayward. Mm. And the fourth one was from Harvard. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a pretty, you know, large spectrum of undergraduate experiences. But we did find a way to, um, you know, get together and network with uh, other uh, minority students also. Because uh, we found everyone was kind of experiencing the same thing. Okay. And you do feel, even uh, the other thing was, I think one advantage that we had was that we had the other schools. We knew who the black medical students were. We knew who the, um, you know, minority pharmacy students were because they often had events together. Okay. Um, so they had formed like what was called a um, black health alliance and they did meet once a month. Mm -hmm. And so you got to meet all the other minority students that were in medical, dental, pharmaceutical, nursing. We had one black hygiene, dental hygiene student. Um, and those were, and I think there was another one that was going for his PhD in hospital management or something. So, oh, wow. okay. so, so that was, it was kind of an interesting crowd, but when we all talked, uh, started talking to one another, we pretty much all had the same concerns. Now, when you said started talking, was there like a, um, I need to learn how to trust you, or I don't know who you are, or I've never found you when you said beginning to talk, what is that? Yeah. Can you unpack that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you wonder, as they said, uh, are you down for the call? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That kind of thing. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, it, it was interesting because there were some students um, who uh, came, and not here, probably in the medical school, who had come from um, uh, universities that had little or no black populations. So for them, it was a real shock to see even the number of black students that we had on campus. Okay. Um, so, and it, it took a while for us to gel, like about half a year at least, you know, having a few meetings, having a few events, uh, that would help. Um, the older, uh, the ones that were in the, um, sophomore junior class at the dental school, uh, tried to help us as much as possible. Like, you know, Hey, you know, this test is coming up, watch out for this, watch out for that. Mm. If you need some help, I've got this, I've got that, um, saved our lives a few times. It, it, it really did. All right. All right. So let me ask you this. So um, you were talking about some tests, and before when we had when we chatted before, you know, you yeah. highlighted some <laughs> you highlighted some things that um, that I want you to share if you share, if, if 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 you wherever you feel comfortable with, uh, because as we know, when you come into dental school, it's a whole it's a completely different animal. What happened in college is completely different once you get into dental school. And so mm -hmm. you started talking about tests and you talk about sharing and, you know, I want to just, if you could just touch on that, you talk, you spoke about some other things, like, but go ahead. Oh yeah. Well, um, as one of the uh, black instructors told us there, they said, you know, the important thing that was happening there was that some students had information, uh, through, you know, either, you know, instructors that were part of their dental fraternity or whatnot. And they knew, and this is the real key thing, not what was going to be on the test, but what was not going to be on mm. the test. Mm. It makes a big, big difference. <laughs> but now you know what you have to concentrate on. Mm. And, you know, we always wondered, you know, how in the world, you know, do they, you know, were they able to like, you know, go skiing on the weekend, come back and ace a test on Tuesday. Uh, you know, the rest of us, you know, we pretty much were up Friday through Monday morning, you know, trying to get ready for any particular test or exam. Um, your first year, that's a big, big learning experience. Um, they used to, uh, the older students used to tell us, look, if you don't know what's going on, go see the professor in, in person. Because to them, you're just a number. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's some of my people in the class, they're teaching, they're on to teach the next class. So if they get to know you or you go there as a group, possibly, you know, they say there's a 50 50 chance they will probably, you know, give you some extra help, uh, particularly lab procedures or some of the, you know, larger, more intense didactic courses that we had to take. Um, so that, yeah, the first year was <laughs> a nice learning year. And it was also probably the, um, as you and I had discussed earlier, you know, the first time, you know, going to doing a lab thing and the professor would come by and, you know, check your work and you'd either say it looks good or you're, or you find it on the floor in a million pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there was that, I saw that happen a few times mm -hmm. and, um, or they told some students, you know, Hey, just quit, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, we'll, we'll see you next semester. Mm -hmm. And there were quite a few students, I say probably about maybe, um, 
about an eighth of a class at the end of our freshman year. Some of us, that was the last time we actually had a summer vacation. Yeah. And some of them were still there after we had finished freshman year and they were having to do, you know, some remedial work and they couldn't move on to the second year until they had completed. Most of it was pretty much lab stuff. And they were very, very big on that, on the um, clinical. So, and it, uh, as one instructor said, they said, that's the first time I'd ever seen a lot of, you know, grown people, you know, crying with tears and the whole bit because they had never experienced anything. I, you know, they used to get in, you know, A's, used to acing tests, and all of a sudden you come to dental school and it's like, nope. Mm. 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 Uh, you know, and that you have to push yourself through and realize you're learning a whole new animal. Um, it's not a biological test. It's not a didactic mm. test. It's not, um, it's not like an SAT or mm. anything like that. You know, a dental school is it's the art and the science that go together. And for some students, you know, it, it was a real steep learning curve. And those are the ones that we used to, you know, you'd hear them saying, hey, I'm not going to, you know, I think I'm going to, we had four drop out after freshman year. We're just left. You know, so, I want to, I want to, sh- uh, before we, because we're about to jump into the topic of why we're on this call. Because you're, you're, it's like you're perfectly pushing us that way. You're, you're going, you're, your story's right in line with that. Um I want to just give those that are watching or who will be watching in the future the story that we were discussing so they're not kind of lost in the, in the shuffle. Okay. So, it, guys, when you get in, um, ladies and gentlemen, when you get into dental school, certain schools, what they'll do is they will give you different, um, uh, what would you call them? Uh, exercises, yeah. Exercises that will allow you to determine how the human anatomy works, specifically in the um, field of dentist in the field of in the mouth and so one of the um, exercises that they had us do is basically shave down a tooth and then build it back up and so what Dr. Diggs was referencing is that you know you'll find your work on the floor uh, when I was in dental school they made us wax a tooth up on our articulator and what happens our articulator is a um, is a device that mimics the jaw, the opening and closing of a jaw, or should I go like this? Because the maxillary doesn't move. <laughs> Let's make this right. Let's make this right. So the max, so the mandible, mandible moves. And so what happens is when you get your articulator, you're building it up in wax. And so back when I was at Meharry 10 years ago, um, they had us, we would have to dress up in business, uh, not business casual, but business attire so i mean shirt tie slack sometimes even a jacket with your white lab coat and we were in tennessee so it's a little warmer there and so we're upstairs and there's like 50 somebody bunsen burners going with a blue flame and it's hot and we're waxing up teeth and we had one or two professors and literally in order to get your checks you'd have to wait and do your do, read um do your work and then go and get a check in place. You can't just go and do your work and then present it. No, everything's a check by check basis. And so literally as I was getting in line, one of my mentors said, and I want you guys to write this down. Everything that Dr. Diggs is saying, I want you to be taking notes. Write this down. Dentistry, dental school is a stress test. All right. Not everything's about race. Not everything's about sexism. <laughs> like some things are just going to be, it's going to be hard. Just like Dr. Diggs said, like, uh, the sciences in your undergrad are not the sciences in dental school. It's a completely different animal. And so when I was going to take my work up, now I've been working on this for at least an hour. I'm in line for about another 20 minutes and we have to about four more checks that we need to complete or we're gonna be behind. And there's 50 other students ahead of me. And so I get up to the to the pr- professor and he gets a check. He's like, Williams, what you got here? And he gets it and he crushes it. And I was like, this joke. <laughs> He ruined my work. I, I've been sitting there for an hour. I've been waiting in line for another 20 minutes, and then I got to go back, do the work, then bring it back. I don't think I'm going to get out of here. I've been in school since 8 o'clock. It's almost 4.30 at night, and I need to come back and get all this work done. And then I need to go back home and then study again. I haven't worked out. I haven't spoke to anybody. It, it gets a little crazy. It gets a little crazy. And so literally, I go back to my desk, upset. I have my articulator. It's hot. I'm sweating get back to my waxing up the tooth on the articulator. I remember what my mentor said. She said, Dr. Betty Shinette, she was a professor at the University of Texas. She said, dental school's a stress test. That was my freshman year, second semester. 
She said, dental school is a stress test. I literally took my articulator back up, did my work, and the professor got my articulator. He did the same thing. What you got here, Williams? Looked at it, crunched it again. And when, as Dr. Diggs was saying, all my work was sitting on the floor. I looked at the professor and I started laughing. And the look, <laughs> and the look that he gave me, he was like, you figured it out. Like, he didn't say that. He didn't articulate because it's not their job to articulate. He was like, he figured, you figured out the system. And I want you guys, the reason why we have these accountability calls is so, because I want you guys to figure out the system, not so that you don't have any heartache and pain, because that's normal process of doing anything great. Like hard work, resilience, that is just normal. But I want you guys, we want you guys to be able to see the pitfalls and navigate them so that you can diversify dentistry, all right? Yeah, so once again, so when he said that and he looked at me, he was like, man, we were having like mental telepathy at that time. He was like, man, he figured it out. And so literally from there, dental school was just a cakewalk. Now don't take it, don't don't get it twisted. Like school was still challenging. I still had uh, um, different pitfalls. But what I wanted you guys to know is this, is that because it's a stress that you know the individual is trying to stress you so that you can become better, your mind will be able to adapt, your emotions will be able to um, be curtailed, and then you'll be able to perform successfully. Like Dr. Dick said, there's individuals that have information that you may not be privy to on a test, not knowing when to study, what to study, how to study, and then you have these individuals that are in dental school to kind of ruffle your feathers, well, ruffle your feathers to prepare you for what's coming. Because as we start getting into the, um, the topic of depression, like you're going to have to understand how to manage it and manage how you are responding to the stressors within the dental school process. And it simply is that. And so, um, Dr. Gibbs, if you could just touch on you were, um, you were highlighting, you know, being able to manage, OK, do I go skiing or do I study? Like, how do I balance it? Because it's a lot of work. I mean, we start make, we start classes at eight o'clock. So if you start class at eight o'clock then you got to be up a little earlier. And then if you end class at five, it's not that you're going home and just going to sleep and eating. <laughs> you got some other things you got there's some things that you should be doing so you have you're gonna choose it in the morning before school starts or after school starts and so if you could just take it from there like how to keep it how you kept it all together to give some insight okay yeah i learned actually around the middle of my freshman year second semester uh, one of the uh, upperclassmen who was like a junior uh, he told me, he said, you know, you know, the best way to do it, he said, you go hard during the week mm -hmm. and try to at least get one day a week uh, on the weekend that you don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's what he did. He said he just went hard five days a week. And then on he would take a break on Saturday and then kind of do preparatory stuff at the end of Sunday. Mm -hmm. That worked for me also, mm -hmm. uh, because on that Saturday, I was, you know, trying to go to jam sessions and stuff like that just to blow off steam. Uh, and it worked, mm -hmm. uh, but it took me a while, you know, to kind of get everything, uh, you know, kind of get it to flow because <laughs> it was trial and error. Believe me. Go back to the go back to the blow off steam. We need to touch on that. That is super important. Talk talk about that blow off steam. What was what type of steam were you blowing off? What was going on? Oh, uh, you know, just from the pressure from dental school. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to get your assignments done on time. Uh, trying to get your lab cases done on time preparing for you know the quiz or the exam that was coming up uh things like that and it was funny i we had a meeting with the assistant dean of students a guy named dr william hoskins um he's only the other i think he's one of two black faculty uh that were on campus and uh for the dental school and uh, three dr phoenix sinclair and he said uh he told us he said you know you perform better in dental school if you have uh, an outlet and you get involved in something outside of dental school mm -hmm. no matter you know to what extent you do it as long as you get in it just to kind of take your mind off of it he said you try to stay in it 24 7 he said you're going to burn out mm -hmm. so find something that you're passionate about or something that just gives you a you know reasonable measure of relaxation mm -hmm. and make sure you incorporate that into your week you know in, into your week's worth of activities he said because if you don't you're going to burn out turns out he was right um, all of us had uh, different things. Um, the other guy in our class that was from Harvard, he had, 
attended Harvard on a basketball scholarship. Mm. Real tall brother, but like six nine. <laughs> and so for the weekends, he played, you know, um, you know, recreational basketball. Mm. Uh, you know, which helped him out a lot. And he did very, very well. Um, others, um, you know, like to. Uh, I know a few of them. One of them was collecting seashells and you know doing artwork with them. Uh, you know, so you know, it's whatever you know. <laughs> Float your boat. So wait a second, wait a second. I gotta interrupt you. I gotta interrupt you because I can feel the student saying, "Wait a second. If you have didactics, which is the book work, and then you have the yeah. clinical, which is in the lab, how in the yeah. hell? <laughs> how in the world? How in the world? How are you gonna? I wait a second because you because like if you're telling me back when you were in dental school you had to have a b average and if you're telling me that if i went to some prestigious school and the training that i got from the sciences is not prepared me to be in dental school and to do well and you're telling me oh just go play some basketball go paint some seashells get an intro <laughs> you got to help me out with that because there's i can feel people saying that right now wait a second how am i going to do that because that's like Yo, I got, I got. Okay, my advice would be this. First, get the school part together. Make sure you've got that down to the point you know, where you feel fairly confident on it. Your um, recreational activity, you just have to work that in wherever you can, mm. when you can. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't start off going, you know, I got all this school work and I have this and that, but I gotta go play basketball first. <laughs> no, 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 you're not do that. Yeah, I mean, your first semester, two semesters, I mean, work into your, you know, get mm. used to your curriculum, get used to the requirements um, that they have set, you know, before you. Um, get, you know, get comfortable with that. Mm. Get to the point, you know, where you really don't want to worry about it uh, too much. And then, in, you know, what little corners of time that you have left, I mean, if you're only able to, uh, you know, play music for like, you know, just 30 minutes, that's yeah. better than not doing it at all, mm. you know. I mean, for me, I couldn't do it during the day, so I would go, I would wait till Saturday after I'd gone through the week, and then luckily I was in uh, San Francisco, which is a incredibly cultural city, you know, in terms of cult cultural diversity and things that they offered. They had, you know, music things, jam sessions, you know, that were going on like around 10 o'clock at night. Mm. So I would go to those and, you know, spend maybe about an hour, hour and a half, you know, either listening or participating or something. So that was my hour and a half for me mm. that, that worked. Uh, I mean, you have to look at also what's available that you can work into your curriculum, not yeah. work your curriculum around it, yeah. work into your curriculum. Because there may be times where you won't be able to do it, yeah. but at least have it handy so that if you do need to access it, it's there. Um, so I usually say, you know, choose something that's not really, you know, a uh, space and time dependent. It's something that's kind of free floating where, you know, oh, hey, look, I've got, say, um, I got about an hour to spare on a Sunday around between two and four, uh, two and three. I can go do something, you know, or whatever. It's painting, drawing, whatever. Go for a jog, uh, go to the gym, something like that. Now, you um, said that... I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say uh, exercise is extremely, extremely, extremely important. That'll uh, blow off your steam. I know a lot of people, they had a gym on our, camp, on our health science campus, and I'd probably say two-thirds of the student body was in there every day after class working out uh that that it really helps clear your head okay. and, uh, now, now you said was that an hour and a half a day or hour and a half a week probably about in the beginning it's going to be about an hour and a half a week <laughs> <laughs> maybe two hours if you can get it in okay uh, you know but as you go along i mean you learn the time management and that's what will kind of help you once you get out you know you get into the professional world because even then, you know, your job is going to be, you know, what you worked hard to, uh, you know, make a living at. It's okay. going to be, you know, your number one priority. But and then you learn to work other things and around it. For a lot of people, you know, what they what the mistake is made is, well, I've got this thing I like to do, and I, and someday I'll do my job. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, well, that's mm -hmm. not going to work. So. You know, make sure that you do do that. Yeah. That that's really important. Um, the balance. If I had to say the key word is is balance. Do strive to have a balanced lifestyle. Um, I know of some you know people, friends of mine, you know who their job is everything. I mean, they are their job. But I would say at least ninety five percent of them are not happy uh, because they don't have anything else to. I mean, there's so more 
there's a lot more to them than just their job. You know, your job is what you do for a living. It's not how you live. Mm. You know, you were something before you went to dental mm. school. You were something before you went to medical school. You were something before you went to pharmacy school. And you do have to stay centered on that because being that is what probably helped you get into dental school, into medical school, into pharmaceutical school, graduate school, whatever. Mm. Um, you know, hang on to that. That that it'll, it'll see you through if you stay connected to it. But if you completely lose it and you don't have that center anymore, you just pretty much are a slave to the rhythm. Mm. Yeah. I, I love how the analogies that you're using go back to music. I love how they, I love it. 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 <laughs> Oh, uh, but that that for me is a is it's a physical, it's a spiritual release. Um, I would have I, if I can just take about please, a couple of minutes. Please, I, please, take your time. I do want to this talk. I do want to dedicate to a um, very, very, very good friend of mine who was in dental school with me. Uh, his name is Dr. Jeff Eaton. Um, unfortunately, he passed away from COVID about probably two, three months ago. But he was one of my main influences. Uh, when I got into dental school, they convinced me, hey, keep on doing music. Turns out he was doing music also. He had played with bands like Tower of Power. He had worked with Angela Bofill. Mm. Um, you know, he worked with major artists before he got into dental school. He's a little older than me. Um, you know, so he's a little older when he got into dental school. But he used to, we used to take those car trips home from San Francisco to uh, L.A. where he lived. And he told me a lot about, you know, how music kept him going. And as we kept in touch on Facebook, turns out he went back, became a faculty member at UCSF, but also when they, and the, what he said was so important that the students at the graduation voted him the keynote speaker, wow. to which he's talked about being centered. You can see it on YouTube, actually. If you look at Dr. Jeff Eaton, commencement address, he actually um, sings. Oh, wow. and play and, and guitar wow. and he talked about how that helped him get through and so you know it was a real big loss when i found out that he had passed away but to have known him and had him as a classmate uh was a really big influence on me so you know if his family's on here i, I appreciate the time that i did have with him he was an excellent classmate he really set a nice example for the rest of us wow so um before you um go any further uh, you, 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 you're not the, I mean, you, you have played with a couple of people yourself. If you could kind of just touch on that a little bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Try to throw that out there. Well, San Francisco is kind of a unique animal. And I think the most interesting experience I had was, um, uh, I, I see my aunt is on here watching and she will tell you mm. uh, when, uh, uh, Gerald Albright used to be in college with me and you know we played a lot together in the same band and a couple of times I brought him over to her house because they live not too far from the university and uh, so you know we've stayed in touch over the years because he's really big time now he's major major artist and work with you know people like Phil Collins and wow. uh, everyone else yeah. and uh, he's one he's one of the people him and a few others that have convinced me to uh, you know hey keep playing you know they said you know this is you know where you belong no matter what else you do make sure you don't you know don't do you know don't stray away from it and i think the most interesting experience i had was it was in san francisco it was this place called the cheshire cheshire club and we were doing a um i guess what you would call like a almost like a jam session but it was like we we're just inviting certain musicians to come up and uh you know play with us mm. and it was down near the wharf and it was, must have been about 11 o'clock at night. We were going to end in about probably 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, we heard this commotion at the back of the club. And we were wondering, what in the world is going on? You know, all these people started coming in. And we thought, well, this can't be us because we don't sound that good. So <laughs> we looked to the back, and here comes this lady, you know, bouncing up to the stage with a Tina Turner-like hairdo, you know, mm. and everything. You're like, wow, who is this? And she goes, I want to play with you guys. Mm. I'm like, Okay, and I, and it took me a second to realize it was Chaka Khan. <laughs> and, I said, oh. and so we asked her. We said, "Well, what do you want to sing?" And she said, "I don't want to sing." She said, "I want to play the drums." I was like, wow. "Drums?" And yeah, she sat in on the drums and she tore it up. Wow. <laughs> it's a little. It's a little known fact that she is a. She's an excellent drummer. Really. Uh, then she got up and she did sing a couple of tunes mm. also with us. Luckily, we knew them, and um, but that was really big highlight wow. you know, and she 
And so she sat down, talked to us, and did a few more numbers with us. And then, you know, her and her entourage went back to the hotel. Uh, turns out she had done a concert at the Old Waldorf, which is a pretty big concert venue, earlier that evening and was just looking for something to do. Mm-hmm. So that was that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, I so, appreciate. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm done. No, I appreciate the fact that it sounds as if when you have an outlet, you'll meet famous people. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is good. This is good. No, um, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Why, when we when we put the call out for individuals, docs to help us out with this, why was depression one of those things that was just like, hey, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna herald that? What, what was that? Why, why did you do that? Um, it because I've seen a few colleagues of mine, you know, kind of uh, succumb to it. I've mm-hmm. seen others get greatly affected by. Um, and as they told us, as I was telling you earlier when we were conversing earlier this week, um, a lot of it, what do they say, that old uh, saying, all unhappiness is caused by comparison? Mm. <laughs> That's a deep one. Mm. <laughs> and it is, it is it's pretty true because when you come out of dental school, you're automatically trying to think that, okay, I'm out, I've got three letters behind my name. I'm going to you know make x amount of money i'm going to drive this i'm going to live up here and this and that and you find out you know in probably the majority of cases it doesn't happen that often i mean that fast as you would like it to and so you tend to get depressed because you hear about other people well i got to practice you know up here in this you know ritzy section of this and you know i got a fleet of bentley's and you know <laughs> private jet to get me to the office every day and not all of us live this i mean for as many people as there are on earth, there's that many different lifestyles. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand that, you know, what you're doing is your path and your stewardship when you do dentistry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not everybody does what you do, Dr. Williams. So, I mean, you have a very unique stewardship that that you were doing. Mm-hmm. And whether people understand it or not is not important. It's the fact that you're doing it and you're helping people immensely by doing it. And I think what a lot of dentists don't realize is that um, you know, when you're doing when you're doing dentistry, whether it be as a student, you know, or you know, you're out in the real world and you're you know trying to get your professional career going, it's really really important to know that you you are unique. Even and, and don't you know just, don't, don't focus on the finances because there are a lot of dentists out there that are making a whole. I'll give you an example, please. Um, recently, a news article came out that I was reading, and uh, this dentist uh was uh was being sued because he was working for this big pediatric dental firm and what happened was he did work on this small child about eight or not nine eight or nine years old in our layman's terms he did root canals on these baby teeth on probably nine of them i think turns out only one needed to have a root canal and so when they got to court and they asked the guy, why did you do these nine root canals? And he said, well, I work for the corporation. They told us we had to do so much per day in revenue or I would lose my job. <laughs> so it's the tail wagging the dog now. Mm. And that gets a lot of dentists depressed because now you're looking at dollars and cents instead of patient care. Um, you know, the dollars come first, the patient comes second. And I think that's where a lot of us make those mistakes. I mean, because, you know, as I was telling you, you know, when you go into dentistry, you develop a personal relationship with that patient. Nobody walks around and tells me, hey, look at this crown that Dr. Smith did for me yesterday. That doesn't happen. I mean, none of us could say, hey, what's in his mouth? I don't know. <laughs> so hey, I just know patients care about two things. Are you nice and does it hurt? <laughs> And that's it. And, you know, cost may be, you know, a, a third factor. But if they, the half of, I'd say probably about 80% of dentistry is developing a relationship, a trusting wow. uh, relationship with the patient. Uh, and they feel comfortable around you. I mean, if you do that, then the rest comes. But for a lot of people, they're simply looking at dollars and cents. I'm going to do X amount a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and granted, it does take money to, you know, run a dental practice. But the depre- what where they get depressed is they go, okay, I want to do X amount this month. And if they don't do it, even if they've done wonderful dentistry and patients are raving about them, they get depressed. Yeah. 
because a lot of us think that, you know, once I get in the dentistry, now I'm, you know, financially set for life and this and that, and this is going to happen. And no, it doesn't. I mean, you know, the economy has changed. The definition of wealth will be changing very soon. Um, what's important is to know that what you do works, you know, is to the best of your ability and you put the person first and that they're satisfied and that they feel confident in you. Um, that's where a lot of people are worried about where, you know, society is going because, you know, we're driven by, well, he's a successful dentist. Yes, but he takes money away from people and does a lot of unnecessary work. Um, that's dangerous too, but some people are willing to take that risk. Right. And it's a lot of those that end up getting depressed because they go, well, I didn't do this today. I didn't make this today. I didn't, you know, this and that today. And, or you have these expectations that the patients are going to come in as was previously believed probably by the previous generation. They're just going to, you know, count out before you and say, oh, whatever you say, we're going to do. No, they're going to question what you do. And your job is to put them at ease and explain it in terms that they can understand and feel comfortable with. Some people that into the profession aren't good at that. They'll look at, okay, you know, you need five fillings, pay at the door. That's it. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. And um, a, the, a person I worked with uh, when I first came to Arizona, you know, told me, he said, you know, get into, he, he, his words real simple. He said, get into the patients. He said, if you get into the patients, the rest will come. Hmm. He said, you, you won't ever, he, he said, I know sometimes you, know, you feel down because you didn't do so much per day and you wanted to do this and that, or that patient was questioning what you were doing or the patient didn't buy the treatment plan. He said, but get into the patient. You will see it will happen. And he's, you know, over the years, I found that to be true. The ones who have the best relationships with patients are the ones who are, and not necessarily in dollars and cents, but are most successful, have longevity in their careers, have a good reputation, mm -hmm tend to get wonderful referrals from other people. The best referral you can get is another person. Yeah. You can advertise all you want, but the best referral you can get is someone who's really happy about you. You've already been screened if they tell another person, hey, he's fantastic, go see him. They'll come in with an accepting attitude. Mm. Someone else agrees about you in the paper and comes in the office, doesn't know what to expect. Wow. As I've seen sometimes walking in, they go, oh, you're black. <laughs> Really? I hadn't noticed. Not any. <laughs> it happens. I mean, those are things, you know, that, that, that we deal with. Or, you know, hey, oh, you're Hispanic or something like that. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's just time, you know, for everybody to you know, start realizing that, you know, dentists come in different shapes, sizes, colors and everything. We all came out of the same, pretty much the same type of school with the same level of knowledge. The difference is what you do personally that uh, makes the difference. Absolutely. So I do, um, I'm going to open the floor up for some questions. Um, so Dr. Latundi and Luma, um, even Denise, uh, Miss Denise, um, feel free to jump in and ask some questions in a second. But I just wanted to highlight this because, like I said, the main thing that we we're going to discuss was depression. So the articles that you sent me, um, and we could drop them down in the um, description below, it highlighted students, the highest level of depression were individuals that did not have any release. That's typically how those art articles read. And as you can see, Dr. Um, Diggs was highlighting the fact that you got to have something that outside of dentistry it doesn't have to overcome your soul, but it needs to <laughs> break up the, um, the challenges of life. And, you know, working out is another good one. Um, so just know that. Um, and then that other big piece, it's something that I have issues with myself as well. And let me just highlight this. Depression is a normal thing. Let me just make this real clear. Depression, I suffer from depression. Um, the form of depression I suffer from is more so the acute form, I would say. And this is just my, like, I'm not a depression expert in no way form that I go to school for this. Uh, but the way, I, way in which I define depression for me is like the acute phase. It's like that one to maybe three days where I'm just like in a funk. I'm just tired. I don't feel like being bothered. It's just, I, and, and the, that depression generally comes from, like Dr. said, I'm watching somebody else when I should be a good steward. And a good a steward, he used a big word there. And not many people use that. That's a, as a, that's a very powerful word. All it is is just manager or custodian. Like that's what that is. And your focus should be on you, not looking over what's going on in, over here, but what's going on in your arena. And so what I want you guys to do is 
make sure you take time on a daily basis even if it's just 10 minutes you go on YouTube do a 10 minute um, exercise I do that to this day Monday through Friday I'm doing 10 minute exercise that's it go for a walk get some um, go for a walk just get your blood moving you don't have to do some crazy stuff you know play music do whatever you got to do to just break it up I don't care how silly it is you were put on this planet for a reason and the Creator has something special for you but you got to tap into it and make sure that um, you're taking care of that and then if your depression lasts longer than than normal I would say longer than I would say two or three days this is just me um, go see a professional. It's normal to um, to get help from a professional. I know mental health is always like it, it, the stigma is being broken, but nobody's gonna get their tooth taken care of by a plumber. Like <laughs> people get cavities. Like everybody has some challenges, and you don't want to just be like, oh, I got this toothache. Let me just deal with it. No, if you have something going on that's that either happened in your childhood or through college or med school. I mean, through dental school or so on and so forth. Even as you graduate finish residency have your own practice get the get the work that you need get the challenge get the get that resolved because we need you in this profession and there's greatness inside of you and I just want to remind you guys that so just keep be aware of that so I'm just gonna open up um, for questions I know Denise she opened up her um, her her mic she's ready to rock and roll go ahead take us away any questions oh I, no I don't have any questions but I do have a comment sure uh, about what my nephew said about uh, your relationship with a dentist. The dentist I currently have, uh, what drove me to him was word of mouth, people that recommended him. And what kept me with him was the relationship he built with me prior and the trust, because I, I'm not unusual. I'm probably like a lot of people. I'm nervous about anything that has to do with dental work because I'm always worried about pain. Mm. But the dentist prior to the one I have now, was all about dollars and cents. Mm. And I didn't know that when I went in to see him, he was very abrupt, very dismissive. He didn't want to answer my questions. He just told me about a very expensive treatment plan I needed to have. And any questions that I had about it, he, he, he I was gonna say he basically shut me down, but he said, you'll just read about it later. I don't need to, I don't have time to explain it to you. And I never went back. I canceled my future appointments with him, found the dentist I have now. And I think as a patient, not being a doctor in dentistry, it's huge mm -hmm. to know that you, you know, you're putting your health in someone's hands. And if they don't take the time and are concerned with your comfort level and your ability to understand procedures and, and what's laid out for you ahead, that makes a huge difference on whether or not you're going to move forward with that person. Mm. So I just wanted to echo that. Yeah, that to me is critical. Um, the rest of you are all in the dental profession. And I'm sure your your questions and comments are going to be far more sp specific related to the process that you do every day. So I'm going to just jump off here now and uh, say to my nephew, I'm very proud of you. You know, I woke up at dawn to, to watch <laughs> we're on the same time so yeah i know i know i know but i'm retired i'm not working so and just so everybody knows that doesn't mean that i'm older than him <laughs> <laughs> people always think that they're like when he says my aunt they're like what is she 80 i'm actually three years younger than him <laughs> mm, yeah. but i am retired <laughs> So I'm going to go back to sleep. But I thank you so much for inviting me. And it was really interesting. I did learn something. I did not know that uh, you had done, uh, you had picked the, the school, the dental school you picked and why and how. I didn't know that. I knew you were in San Francisco. I didn't know why you went there. So um, I just, you know, and that was interesting to learn. I noticed yeah. you did. I mean, so, yeah, there was some things that I didn't know. I guess we didn't talk about all those details a hundred years ago when when you were a hundred. <laughs> ah, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But it was wonderful seeing you, nephew, and yes. everybody that's already a dentist. Keep up the good work. Everybody who's in route to becoming a dentist. Good luck. Best wishes. And uh, you all have a blessed and happy holiday weekend. Thank you, Miss Denise. I appreciate it. Thanks, bye -bye. Auntie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> I have a question. Um, sure. How do you deal with, how do you not take things too personally and then let it affect you and bring it down? So I've worked 
in out in practice and where I've worked, uh, usually I'm typically the only black person there. Everything's fine. I read self-help books. I stay um, really up to date with my knowledge and the CE and everything. I feel very confident going to office. And then every now and then, or like once a month, you have someone that reminds you who you are, either a patient or a staff member, you overhear say the N word in a conversation or a customer, oh, why'd they leave? Oh, um, oh, sorry, um, they, they didn't want to see someone who was, um, um, black. And then, you know, it just not, I just, you know, I, I put like a stone cold face on, I'm like, oh, well, they're, they're lost. And sometimes I go home and I'm like, crap, like it brings me down. And then it's hard to bounce back up. Like I, I portray myself like a confident, uh, well educated minority female, but then I don't know, sometimes like those comments, they really dig at me and it makes me feel like, like nothing but then then again like I came so far I am like so how do you deal with like that type of negativity how do you not want I want to be to the point where it doesn't bother me I can hear those comments in it in when you're out the other but I'm not gonna lie like it hurts when I hear those comments like you go along and then you hear people still think like that like not everyone but a good amount of people and it makes me feel like oh like I wish I was more in a black community and like that shouldn't be the case i shouldn't want to feel comfortable anywhere but i get it that's not like the reality but yeah it stinks how do you deal with that okay um there is a uh, if you can get it there is a book written by uh, one he's no longer with us but a guy named norman vincent peel he talks about uh you have a muscle that you exercise when you go to the gym. Mm. There's also something called the spiritual muscle, which needs to be exercised also. And what he meant by that is you're going to have problems. People aren't going to like you and things like that. How you respond to it is mm. what builds your spiritual muscle. And, you know, with, with our profession, it's more cute, to say the least, because it's an intimate relationship. You know, it's almost like, you know, your, your spouse telling you, you know what, you really suck, get out, you know, or something <laughs> like that. That, you know, it stays with you because you are with, you have a bond to that person. You know, don't take it personally because remember, you know, you, you went through school, you learned what you needed to learn, you passed your state boards. Um, obviously they found you competent. Patients are not, are very poor judges of dental work. Um, a lot of times they say, well, you, you, I mean, if you have someone call you on an emergency, most times they'll say, you know, there's something hanging off my tooth and I don't know what it is and this and that. And you can't judge, you know, I mean, that's their perception of it. And when they come in, you find out there's nothing but maybe an enamel chip mm -hmm. or something like that. But they blow it up into, you know, you think that they're missing half their dentition. There's rib pieces hanging out the gum and things like that. So, um, you know, basically just remember that, you know, they're not the dentist you are and what they say to you is their personal perception it's not a universal perception mm -hmm. and it took me a while to you know i've gone into funks in my in first 10 years of my practice uh you know days i didn't want to go to work um but it's it, it it's just a fact of life basically and what we do is you know we try to get those connections with with patients if you don't get them the attitude you can take is well, gee, that's just too bad. They didn't get to meet someone as wonderful as me and develop a relationship. Let them move on and let them move on. But I will I will bet you that the person who got you depressed, if they went and saw someone else that you knew and you were to um, ask them about that patient, it's going to be the same thing. They basically, what it is, is they're just dissatisfied with themselves. And they have certain things that they want to see that either may be totally, you know, unrealistic or something like that. Remember, it's their personal perception, not the universal perception or whatever. You know, they, they did that experiment with people. They showed an accident and they had uh, five people look at it. All five people told a different story. All yeah. five people told a different story. And that's pretty much how it is. Um, you know, but you wouldn't be in practice. Now, how long have you been in practice? I worked for six years and then I went back to school and specialized in pedo and then now I'm graduating and going back out to the workforce. But unfortunately, I work in the, I'm going to work in the West Texas, which is very, um, <laughs> not, uh, uh, yeah. so that's why I'm trying to prep myself reading a lot of uh, books. Yeah. It's no 
feels like, you know, I'm a lone ranger out there, which I don't mind, but I know I have to prepare myself to be mentally strong to, like, deal with, you know, people. I've heard things like, I don't want to see her. Or, no, uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely ignorance out there, Christy. And, and, and yay, Pedo, you know, me, pediatric dentist, <laughs> we need you. Uh, and we especially need you, you know, in these areas of West Texas, just – separate the ignorance from the kids that the population you're serving the kids need you and they don't have those racist perspectives but you know uh, first of all hello everyone i apologize got my time zones mixed up this morning i think <laughs> coming <laughs> off of a high from we had an amazing discussion yesterday at the academy of pediatric dentistry on systemic racism and in talking to jean sinkford now just think about her she was the first dean of a dental school the first black woman, well, the first woman dean, and she happened to be a black woman mm -hmm. dean. So I remember asking her, uh, we had a conversation, and, you know, when she, we talked about those issues when she was faced with these types of obstacles and challenges, she just said, you know what, especially as black women, we are strong and resilient, mm -hmm. and we, we know it's there, but it doesn't stop us, mm -hmm. right? You just have to mm. keep on, playing. and in my own practice too, I, I get it, I have gotten it, and I still will get it, I'm sure, in the future. Um, and it hurts, it's not to say, you should be strong, resilient, not worry about it, it hurts. I have had many days I've come home crying, or just crying in the office, right? And just You have to wipe away the tears and put on a smile and just keep on going. Um, but that's all I would say, it's just keep on going. And you know, if they don't want to see you, thank God, Finally, you'll get to that point where like, oh, yeah. they, I don't have to deal with that patient because there's, you're only gonna remember the handful of those people that say these types of things, but not the thousands of lives that of, of parents and kids who love you and can't wait to see Dr. Christie. And it's gonna be okay. And um, there's a place for them and they need to just go ahead and find it, all right? And it's, it's at this their disadvantage, but um, keep going, we need you and, and <laughs> Unfortunately, it's going to take a lot of prayers to change hearts, <laughs> and we're just going to keep on going. So, yay! Yeah, I'm so it's glad you're coming out. <laughs> you know what? Actually, on our um, on our YouTube page, Christy, if you go to Diversity and Dentistry Mentorships, I have our full length interview with Dr. Singford on there. So, it's really moving. You just leave, come up from it, just like. Oh, she could do it. <laughs> Coming out of dental school in 1958, mm -hmm. you know, being the first uh, to graduate first in her class as a woman after 73, the 73 year history of Howard Dental School. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just, I just look up to her so much. So I encourage, encourage you to, to watch it. <laughs> I will do. Thanks. I think that's the thing we have to remember is the, is our, people who came before us did more with less mm -hmm. with, with what with what they faced. The more I go back to where I grew up and I hear about, um, you can just give me just a second. There were a group, I was telling um, you know, Dr. Williams about it. Um, when I grew up, there was a group of medical graduates uh, that came out in the early 50s out of Meharry Medical College. They were able to go to Los Angeles, buy some land, and build the Julian W. Ross Medical Center. They named it in honor of one of their professors. That became one of the top medical uh, groups in the Los Angeles area. And we're talking about like 1952, 53, when they did it. And it ran until literally, I think all of them either retired or passed away. That's a, that's a running of about 50 something, 40, 50 years. And they started it, you know, back when, you know, discrimination was, you know, way, and, you know, how did they get the land? How did they pull? But there was something where they had the can-do attitude. Mm. And they didn't care what other people thought. And I'm sure, you know, when they built the building, you know, from the ground up and, you know, they went in there uh, and started practicing, a lot of people thought, oh, no, no. But it turned out that, as I was telling you, um, Dr. Hishaw, it didn't, they didn't just see poor black people, they saw all the black people. I mean, people lived there, they lived all the way up in uh, Beverly Hills and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they were good. Mm -hmm. People knew that, that they were good. And yeah, right. people, you know, they had their, their rough times or whatever, but they, they stuck with it. And in the end, they became known as one of the, you know, better dental uh, um, medical clinics than, you know, the entire Southern California area. Yeah. So that just shows, you know, on, on another extreme end where you can do, yes, yeah, shout out to my area. 
I mean, yeah, they put out some really excellent graduates, you know, and, what, and they were <laughs> they were my influence to go to dental school because one of them was my pediatrician and um, the other one was my mother's OBGYN. And I mean, they said, you know, you're going, I said, I'm, I'm thinking of going to dental school. And they said, don't think about it, go. Mm. <laughs> It, well, okay. Oh, well, yeah. That's their attitude. There was no quit. They just, you know, when it did. And yeah. the, the, I still am forever grateful to them for what they told me. Yes. Thank you. Luma, did you have some? Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Christy, for your input and just being transparent. Um, like I said, there's individuals who are going to watch this uh, many, uh, many years from now and be like, man, thank you for that transparency. Because that's transparency is where individuals are able to. Um, heal and grow. So thank you for that. Um, Luma, you were about to say something? Yes. Um, welcome to Texas, Dr. Christie. <laughs> it, gets, <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to mention, like, um, from what you mentioned, um, I work in healthcare IT. Um, I Most of my information has my first name, Mavis. So I will send out an email for the introduction and everything. And then when I get on the call, they'll like send an email to Mavis. Because I'll get on the call, I'll introduce myself as Luma. And then they'll send an email to Mavis. They were like, this was horrible. Why were you not, not on this call? It was some weird girl with an African accent. And I'm like, hi, that's me. <laughs> because um, the way I've learned to deal with that is um, what my dad taught me. He's like, are you a thermostat or a thermometer? Mm. If you're a thermometer, whatever happens, you catch up to it. Mm. If it's hot, you get hot. Mm. If it's cool, you get cool. But if you're a, a thermostat, regardless of what is going on, you maintain your you maintain it. If it's hot and you're set to cool, you remain cool. So I had to learn, or I've had to learn, uh, being project manager for the West Region, to be that thermo the, 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 the thermostat to stop being a thermometer because there's some people that would be just straight. Mm. And the first instinct is to respond to them the way they approach me. And then I have to remember, I'm here to do a job and that's what I'll go with, be the thermometer, not the, be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Mm. But regarding um, Dr. Diggs, um, you gave a lot of insight for what dental students should do. Um, I was wondering how you apply that to those applying. Like right now in the application cycle, they have like four or five Facebook groups and someone will come post on there. Oh, I have a 3.9 GPA and I scored a 24 on my DAT. What are my chances? And um, on the other groups, you see like the other students like, okay, I just have a 3.2. So should I not even bother applying? Like there is a lot of pressure in the professional program already. How about those still trying to get in because they put so much stress on themselves and they're already discouraged before even trying? I had a student, uh, it was a few years ago, and uh, he graduated from one of the Southern California colleges, came to me, he was basically born and raised in Tucson. And I asked him, he said, well, I'd like to apply to dental school, but I don't think my uh, I don't have enough science in my background and I don't think my GPA is high enough. And I said, well, then let's see if we can raise it up. What do you think you need to do? He decided to go, he went back to the local college and took the core courses that were needed, raised his GPA, uh, you know, to above, like I think a three, I think got to 3.2, like you said, 3.3, took his DAT uh, and scored pretty well on it when he didn't do the first time and got accepted into UCLA dental school. And he's now working with the government and the Navy. Uh, the lesson on that was he didn't give up. He kept trying. He kept trying. Um, the main thing is to find out, you know, what the, uh, you can go, there's some books that tell you, you know, exactly what, you know, the average entering DAT score actual, you know, GPA is or whatever. But then remember that that's the average. There's a spread in both directions. So, you know, going there, you know, if you don't make it the first time, look at what you were missing, go back, fix it, do it again. Do it, do it again. You'll never know unless you try. And to add on to what you said, uh, two things. One, the internet lies. 
Everyone lies on there. You know, it's funny you say that because I, you know, I went to dental school, I don't know, like nine, ten years ago. You know what's funny? I had a 3.2 GPA. I had a 3.2 GPA. Um, I was super, super involved, president of pre-dental society, super involved. And like when I did uh, talk to different people, they said, oh my gosh, you have a 3.2. I'm like, yeah, because I was busy making the community great again. No point, no point on that. Go ahead. <laughs> but I was Go ahead, super Christy. involved, and that's why I had a GPA. I said, that's the best I could do with all the pots I was in. I had 16 interviews, nine acceptances, to the point where I had to withdraw my application because it was getting too hectic. Too many flights. I was booked, busy, busy and booked. So it's like, don't let anything like that discourage you. I was discouraged initially, but then I was like, when I taught this, and a lot of people, they're like, wow, well, that's why your GPA is lower because you're doing so many things. So I would have had a 4.0 had I just focused on school, but that wasn't my focus. My focus was the community as well. So mm-hmm. I had, um, you know, a full pack CV, full resume, full application. So wherever you're deficient, you have to make up for it in other places to make you like a well-rounded candidate. So it's definitely not impossible. Mm. You know, I did it and that was just on one round. Congratulations. Yeah, because um, for instance, we started um, diversity in the industry, started like the support, a support group for applicants. And just from like the announcement, we had like 30 people signed up because everybody's trying to find some release, which I believe this talk uh, is important. Like, how do you manage it? Because, and I look at it, I'm like, you're already stressed now. You're not seen the first of it. Because <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Williams. <laughs> because I just feel like, I just feel like they have like this mystery, like they make it so mysterious or so stressful at the start of the process that by the time most people start dental school, they're really burnt out from applications. Mm. And it's how to help with that because if you, um, like my brothers that did med school, they're like, you learn the system so you can bid it. How do you help them? How do you help the next generation to change the faces to handle that stress or the process that way they can be them because I'm certain if they can be the best version of themselves, they can be the best applicants, the best dentist. So how help them along that process to manage the stress That's and, manage this, and manage this muscle? Yeah. <laughs> Christy, we need you as a mentor, okay? Because <laughs> we do, yeah. And, and and I'm glad we have that support system there. Thank you so much. Um, if they need that we need each other and that the the students need accountability with each other to you know separate them from the toxicity that's out there on the, the interwebs <laughs> well good 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 uh, i don't know was that a question luma it wasn't a that question. was a statement okay okay, okay 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 and also luma just talk 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 as like I remember when I was applying, I was so intimidated because everyone else like had good score. From what they say, had good scores, good everything, and um, the thief of joy, you know, to comparison for sure. But it was just funny, you know. All the people I talked to, the more you talk, the more you reach out. You reach out to people, people that I volunteered with. They're like, "Oh, you're applying for dental," and I, why didn't you say anything? I'm like, "Oh, I, oh, I know the the dean at uh, such and such school. Let me let me get him on the phone right now." And I'm like, <laughs> you know. So it's like, you just never know. Just keep putting yourself out there. You know, being a hermit and working on yourself doesn't do you any good. Mm. You have to get out there, talk, see what I like. Talk. I was scared to talk to people and compare, but then now I enjoy talking to people and compare so I can learn, so I can get, get the advantage. So you just use everything to your benefit. Don't uh, don't ever leave any stone unturned because it's just your loss, you know? So always yeah. do, do your best, focus on yourself and get yourself out there and just, you know, do it as much as possible. Indeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, everyone, it's been a pleasure once again. Um, it seems like this time goes by so quickly. Um, Dr. Diggs, I just want to say thank you for um, waking up at the crack of dawn, like your aunt <laughs> said, to do so. The reason why- this is my wake up call. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why we have this call at this time is because for those who want it, they will, they will move heaven and earth to get this information. And even though it's gonna be placed up late, posted later on YouTube, um, this is an opportunity for individuals to get their answer, their questions answered. And so 
Um, once again, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Diggs, for taking your time out to share and be transparent because as you can see, um, you have two future leaders of America that are just taking in all the information that you have and um, you've made dentistry that much better. So I just want to say thank you for what you're doing and how you're doing it. And so this wraps up our, oh, good. No, I just said my pleasure, my pleasure, anytime. <laughs> And so this wraps up our accountability call for May 30th, 2021. And so once again, we want to let you know at Diversity in Dentistry, if we did it, you can too. Make it a great one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.